Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Cheryl Telford, Chair of the Wildlife Habitat Council Board and Chief Sustainability Officer, Vice President of EHS of the Comores Company. I'm so pleased to welcome you all to the opening of the 2021 Wildlife Habitat Council Conservation Conference. We're so excited to host these two days of learning and celebration. So thank you for joining us wherever you are around the globe. In years past, I've always left WHC conference feeling inspired, inspired by the presenters and inspired by our members and the conservation work undertaken at your sites around the globe. Thank you for making a difference. Every act of conservation does matter. And I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to thank our sponsors. All of this great programming is thanks to their generosity. So thank you so very much. And before I turn it over to our leader, WHC President Margaret O'Gorman for her State of Corporate Conservation Address, I have the honor to present the Gold Program of the Year Award. This is one of our top awards and recognizes the overall depth of one exceptional uh, program in the gold certified tier. Previous winners have included Fidelity Investment Smithfield, Coke Industries, Beaverhead Branch, and General Motors Canada Cami Assembly Plant. And this year, we're honored to present the Gold Program of the Year Award to, drum roll please, Ontario Power Generation, Western Waste Management Facility, and Bruce Complex. Ontario Power Generation's Western facility, located on the beautiful shores of Lake Huron, is honored to receive the Gold Program of the Year from the Wildlife Habitat Council. This recognized the depth of our program, as well as our corporate commitment to biodiversity and climate change mitigation. We partnered with local ecologists, industry peers, and many others to improve habitats, and protect species at risk in and around our site. Our program consists of 14 projects within eight categories, ranging from bird marsh monitoring, removal of invasive species, habitat creation for birds, snakes, and turtles, to awareness and community engagement. We're all very proud to receive this year's Gold Program of the Year Award. Congratulations to OPG and the team at Western Waste Management and Bruce Complex. That short video really highlighted some amazing work, the depth of the program across so many different categories. Truly remarkable. So thank you and congratulations. I'm looking forward to the presentation of more awards after, these, after this session, 10 o'clock. But now please welcome WHC President Margaret O'Gorman for the State of Corporate Conservation. Good morning and um, congratulations to OPG. Uh, thank you, Cheryl, for the introduction. And we are very to have, ha happy to have you as our new board chair and we look forward to doing great things with you. So it's my pleasure to welcome you to WHC's Conservation Conference of 2021. This is our second virtual gathering, and we continue to miss our wonderful in-person celebrations of corporate conservation. We miss hearing about your efforts and sharing your successes. But we're going to do our best over the next two days to bring you stories from across our community and highlight the best programs from this year's certification applications. So please, as Cheryl said, make sure you attend the award sessions today and tomorrow. And also, please mark your calendars for our hopefully in-person gathering next year. 
for the first time in our history, we're moving our conference away from the Eastern Seaboard. And I am very excited to announce that next year we will be celebrating corporate conservation in Detroit on June 14th and 15th. This move is only fitting as the state of Michigan has 85 WHC certified programs, the most of any state in the nation. Now, as you all know, it's been a challenging year for corporate conservation as restrictions continue to impact access to programs and the ability of wildlife teams to gather. But given the challenging times, we still received a healthy number of program applications in 2020, with 271 program applications, of which 213 were programs renewing, 80% of, of those due for renewal, and an additional 46 new or previously expired programs applying for certification. In 2020, we received applications from 10 new companies. So well done and welcome to Ariens, Bruce Power, Crestwood Midstream, Davy Resource Group, De Maria Building Company, EMD Serono, Cosmos Cement Company, Liberty Utilities, Tetratech, and WR Grace. Our 2020 applications contain 872 unique projects with grasslands being our most common habitat project, avian the most common species project, and in our education theme, awareness projects emerged as the most common, likely reflecting the pandemic environment and the challenges of hosting training events or formal education programs. We understand the challenges of remaining actively engaged during the pandemic, which is why we instituted the COVID accommodations. 72% of program applicants use the accommodations in their application last year. And as many of you know, we are extending the accommodations through 2021 as the impacts are still being felt at operations across the world. But we encourage you to try to get back to best conservation practices for managing and monitoring as soon as you can. Because we are looking forward to a return to normal, to a place where we can remove the accommodations so that we can get back to reviewing applications at their most complete. We know our applicants are doing a good job and want to recognize this by receiving and reviewing full applications. But given all the challenges we faced and the accommodations, we are very grateful to our applicants. Of the 271 applications we received in 2020, 259 were successful, with 67 achieving silver status and 32 recognized as gold certified programs. Congratulations to all who submitted applications, to all the successful applicants and to the 99 programs that excelled. Thanks to your hard work, WHC currently recognizes 633 certified corporate conservation programs in 20 countries and 47 states in the US. Reviewing all of these projects kept 40 external reviewers busy during the two peak periods for application submission mid-July and December. I'd like to thank all of our reviewers for their work. Because reviewing project applications is not an easy job. Scoring biodiversity efforts across habitats and species and events is not an easy job. We learn every year about what is working and what is not working with our standard. And no standard is static. Since we launched conservation certification in 2015, we've been making changes in response to feedback from applicants and reviewers. This feedback helps us to improve consistency, clarity and credibility. We are currently on version 1.3 of conservation certification and are building out a process to launch a version two in coming years. So stay tuned, but keep the feedback coming. This year, we've welcomed new members to the WHC community of corporate conservation. We welcome the Ports of Indiana, Salve, Energy Transfer, Niagara Water, Blaze Metals and K2 Gold Corp, EMD Serono, and Consultant Groundwater and Environmental Services, GES. These new members show that WHC's model flexes across industry sectors and fits companies of all sizes in all geographies. It also, and more importantly, shows that there is a continued and increasing interest by the private sector in biodiversity. We've definitely seen interest and engagement grow over the last year, 
And while I still worry about the depth of that engagement and the absence of meaningful investment in the global biodiversity crisis, I am pleased to recognize a trend of greater engagement because we need it. The global goals for biodiversity, the Aichi targets, that were established by the Convention on Biological Diversity and ratified by 119 countries in 2011 have failed to deliver. The Aichi targets called for habitat loss to be halved and ecosystem degradation and fragmentation to be significantly reduced. They called for increased awareness of the value of biodiversity and the actions needed to protect it. Under these targets, protected areas would increase significantly. Invasive species would be identified, prioritized, controlled, and eradicated. And financial resources would be mobilized to help meet the targets. Not one single goal has been met, and only six out of the 20 have been partially achieved. If the Aichi targets were an employee, they'd be on a performance improvement plan right now. But hope springs eternal, and this year, along with the new members and corporate clients seeking out WHC as a partner for corporate conservation, the world's thought leaders and prognosticators are saying that biodiversity's time has finally come. In January 2021, Bloomberg News addressed the transformation of corporate ESG in 2020, suggesting that biodiversity would finally join emissions and climate change in the E of ESG, thanks to increased recognition that the biodiversity crisis is, and I quote, a natural catastrophe that could have enormous economic consequences with more than half of the world's total gross domestic product dependent on natural resources from food to ingredients for medicine. While we can take much of this type of prognostication with a large pinch of salt, especially in the chaos of a post-pandemic world, I for one am happy to see the biodiversity crisis listed among the other ESG concerns that corporate citizenship must reckon with. At national and international levels, we are seeing the World Economic Forum continue to press the global risk of biodiversity loss. We are seeing policy recommendations like the Convention on Biological Diversity's post-2020 framework, proposed regulations like the EU due diligence, and global initiatives like the Leaders' Pledge for Nature, with political leaders from 84 countries committing to reverse biodiversity loss by 2030, saying a transformative change is needed. We cannot simply carry on as before. This year, we get a redo of the Super Year for, year for Nature, which is meant to happen in 2020. And business, through the Business for Nature initiative, is front and center. And this future for nature means that we all have to advocate, this super year for nature, excuse me, means that we all have to advocate for nature. From the corridors of governmental power to our own backyards and communities, we need to advocate for nature. Tomorrow we will talk about what that means and how different companies are doing it. But we do need to understand that this year is a vital one for nature and the decisions that are made will determine the health and well-being of our natural world for the next decade and beyond. When we think about the health and well-being of our natural world, we sometimes think about nature in wild and distant places. But we should also think about nature at home. And certainly where I'm living, nature is very much present at the moment. Here in the Washington DC region, we're experiencing a natural phenomenon that explodes the myth that nature is everywhere. This phenomenon is urban in nature, which explodes the myth that nature is only in wild places. And I'm talking about the emergence of the largest brood of 17-year periodical cicadas. About a month ago, as the ground warmed up from the winter, holes started appearing around the bases of trees. And from these holes climbed little armored tanks of insects who quickly found a telephone pole, tree trunk, or even a car or bicycle wheel, where they climbed further to shed their exoskeletons and participate in loud mating calls to secure their species' future. These cicadas were first described by a self-taught African-American scientist from Maryland called Benjamin Banneker. And they have emerged in their billions from Washington DC to Michigan every 17 years to the light of kids, the curious, and to the disgust of the squeamish. But this phenomenon also reminds us that the wonders of nature are all not fully understood, 
as we have questions about the reason for the 17 year cycle. And it also reminds us of the awesomeness of nature. And another reminder of the awesomeness of nature will come from a fascinating panel this afternoon that tells the story about how the horseshoe crab is connected and critical to our COVID recovery. But if you want to learn more about the 17 year periodical cicadas known as Brood 10, we have a great webinar from earlier this year that was designed to connect kids to this cool experience and a very informative blog post. But this phenomenon reminds us of the importance to look into our own communities for opportunities to engage with nature, but also to support nature. As the private sector continues developing goals and commitments for both climate and biodiversity, it's important to remember that the nature positive journey should start at home, that local challenges require local solutions, and that when the private sector makes significant investments for nature-based solution to achieve net zero carbon or net zero loss for biodiversity, it should direct some of those investments to the places where they do business and have an impact. This is the impetus behind our new white paper for our Climate Action Works initiative sponsored by Cleveland Clips, where we call for a community first approach to climate action, to encourage the corporate world to divert a fraction of their investments in distant carbon offset programs to implement nature-based climate solutions in the communities in which they operate. By adding these approaches to a company's portfolios of projects, communities where impacts are felt can realize a plethora of health, well-being, and social benefits. By being community first, a company can cross its fence line and create people and planetary value. A company can join the dots between climate, conservation, and community. And we are also pressing for community first approach in our project with the US Forest Service in support of the National Strategy for Urban and Community Forestry. We are working with project partners Freeport McMoran, DTE, GM, Waste Management, BASF, and as well as partners Dave the Institute, Greening of Detroit, the Student Conservation Association, and others to develop a best in class approach to corporate engagement in urban and community forestry. As companies rush to adopt forestry goals as part of the Trillion Tree campaign or their own internal goals, we seek to establish an approach for corporate-led community and urban forestry efforts that strengthens and builds on existing community efforts, contributes to local canopy goals, and supports community climate resiliency efforts. And as nature-based solutions that include forestry and other ecological approaches continue to gain acceptance across the corporate world, we will continue to teach and learn from our members and partners about best practices for design and implementation. We want to make sure that the practices we promote are scientifically sound and socially beneficial. And in pursuit of this, we are publishing later this year a catalogue of nature-based climate solution for corporate lands sponsored by Shell. And another exciting project that intersects with our interest in nature-based solutions and community-first approaches and scientifically sound efforts is our IBM EdTech Challenge, where groups of college students are forming to create teams to deploy IBM technologies of artificial intelligence and cloud computing to solve environmental challenges in the Chicagoland region. We thank IBM for their support of this program, but we are looking forward to seeing what these students develop in terms of addressing air quality, water quality, or biodiversity loss. And our education efforts don't stop there. This past year and a half, our education programs reached almost 12,000 people through live webinars and recordings with attendees from across the world, from corporate, government, and civil society groups. We thank our sponsors, especially the ASF, who supported the extension of our kid-friendly webinars into a second year. And WHC has been busy this past year consulting with companies to build sustainable conservation strategies visiting sites to support on the ground efforts, providing education for kids and adults, and publishing materials to support corporate conservation efforts worldwide. We supported both big and small forestry efforts, restoration programs for birds, bats, bugs, and butterflies, as well as for grasslands, wetlands, and other habitats. 
and we've supported corporate STEM and environmental education efforts. We've worked at the site level and the corporate level and have convened across and within industry sectors, including with longtime collaborators, the Spires Partnership for the Environment and new partners, the Business for Nature Coalition and the Earth Lab Mexico. And through all of this work, we are seeing and identifying trends across our membership. We are seeing a recognition of the need for global presence as Bayer, IBM and others have commissioned toolkits and support for such approaches across their operations. We've seen more companies take multi-dimensional approaches to nature positivity, whether it's GM's examination of designing diversity into the workplace or many others connecting across their supply chains. Efforts designed in response to COVID restrictions still play into corporate engagement with virtual workshops and dispersed employee engagement activities. And through it all, nature has been the common language that unites us. Last year, we were consulting with the midstream company to help develop a conservation strategy. And as an icebreaker, we asked the internal stakeholders gathered in the room to share their relationship with nature. It was fascinating. The people in the room that were living in rural areas or with rural upbringings talked about the systems of nature, a forest that they loved to hunt in or a wetland that they played in as a child. While those who had a more urban life experience talked about a specific individual, a cardinal that visited their window every day, or a tree they planted at their first house. This unscientific observation speaks to the fact that there's no single correct way to connect with nature, and that everyone has a nature story, and that a single bird or tree can hold the same value to a person or community as a wetlands complex or an intact forest. And as we advance an agenda of community first conservation for the private sector, we need to internalize that observation and think about the different ways of seeing nature, of valuing nature, and of interacting with nature. We know that nature will play a critical role in cooling our earth and protecting our homes, but we must also remember that nature itself needs help too. And we talk a lot at WHC about joining the dots whether it's from the C-suite to the operation, across operations in different locations, along supply chains or to national and regional conservation priorities. And as we ramp up deployment of nature to solve our most pressing problems, we now need to join the dots between intent, action and impact, and make sure we design solutions that yes, address the specific issues with nature-based solutions, but also that pride provide uplift for biodiversity and bring benefit to people. It's not hard to do when the dots are joined and the conservation strategy is integrated. We'll hear more about some of these efforts over the next two days as we honor outstanding programs with our project awards and highlight interesting stories through our panels. And you'll also hear from two fascinating keynote speakers, one, a professor of zoology and curator of ornithology at Harvard University, Scott Edwards, who cycled across the country last year observing birds and people. And our other keynote, Tina Claffey, who spends her time with her camera in the bogs of Ireland, documenting the small beauties found in peatlands. In addition, and in an effort to recreate some of the great networking we usually see at our in-person conference, We've organized three networking events designed by staff who attended some of the best and worst online networking events during the past year. Be sure to check them out. Please enjoy the conference and engage as much as possible with the content, the speakers, the sponsors and each other. And finally, as we welcome our new board chair, Cheryl Telford, we must also recognize the impact of our outgoing chair, Bill Cobb. Bill has left a great legacy from his two terms leading the board and leaves the organization in a stronger financial position and strategic direction, finely tuned to the current and future trends of the corporate world in relation to biodiversity and corporate ESG. Bill remains on our board and our executive committee and will, just like the periodical cicadas, bring a lot of noise to our conference in Detroit next year. So thank you so much. Welcome to our conference. And please let me know if you have any questions right now. My colleague Monica has been monitoring the chat box for anybody who has comments or questions on my remarks. Thank you. 
Margaret, I do have a question. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, wonderful. The question is, what is the biggest challenge facing corporations attempting to integrate biodiversity targets into their net zero impact commitments? Thanks, Monica. I think there are many challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that the impacts of biodiversity are local on a corporate level, but the biodiversity crisis itself is global. So how a company can, again, connect the dots between the impact it is having at a site and the uplift that biodiversity global needs to have is a very challenging question. And one I think that a lot of companies have been struggling with for many, many years. So I think that is one of the biggest challenges to integrating. Carbon is easy to measure, but biodiversity loss is, and biodiversity uplift are very difficult to measure. So I think that is one of the key challenges. Great, our next question. We've tried to use our biodiversity program as a way to reconnect with the community and our own employees. Has WHC seen this as a trend across its members and has it been successful? We're seeing companies more and more using um, conservation activities as a return to work um, tool to allow employees to engage in a socially distant yet together way on the outside. And increasingly also we are seeing companies use cross their fence lines and I will talk about the work that we've been doing on the urban and community forestry program, especially in um, Northwest Indiana, where we have a collective effort of companies coming across their fence lines to work together to um, plant trees in an area that really needs some community forestry and doing that in a way that helps them connect better into the community. So what we're seeing more and more of is companies kind of really think about the broader impact of their efforts that are, they're having on the ground and how they can leverage those efforts in multiple ways to bring co-benefits to employees, whether it's return to work or just you know, standard employee engagement efforts, but also out into the community. Um, and of course, you know, many of our award-winning project, projects and programs have a big community impact in them because it's something as an organization that we value and that we've valued for a long time. Okay, our next question. Um, can you talk more, excuse me, can you talk more about the interconnectivity of biodiversity with other ESGs and SDGs? Well, I would argue that biodiversity is the foundation of a good life on this planet, which is basically what the SDGs are designed to, um, are designed to make happen. And with the SDGs, you, we have um, published a paper last year about the integration of biodiversity with the SDGs. So whether we're talking about just the SDGs that is life on land or SDGs related to, to resilient communities, um, to safe places to, to live, um, even to access to education, biodiversity can bring an element to satisfy those ESGs, sorry, SDGs. And when we look at corporate sustainability goals, we view that the um, biodiversity is one of the few positive sustainability KPIs. Most sustainability KPIs are erased to zero, you know, reduced use of water, zero waste to landfill, et cetera. But the biodiversity KPI within a corporate sustainability initiative is all about uplift and increase. It's about increasing habitat, increasing biodiversity. And it's a really positive one to have within a company, but it's also one of the few SDG, sorry, corporate KPIs that a company can actually put its hands on, that any employee in the company can put its hands on, from the CEO to the security guard, because it's accessible. Not all employees can, you know, deal with waste or deal with recycling or deal with water use, but every employee can actually have an impact on biodiversity. So we see that it's very intersectional in its um, in the way it touches SDGs and sustainability KPIs and other CSR goals that a company might make. 
Great, next question. You mentioned that you are seeing an increasing interest by the private sector in biodiversity. Do you anticipate one particular sector to lead the next wave of participation in corporate conservation? Well, that's a really interesting question. When we look at who has the most experience dealing with um, ESG-focused impacts on biodiversity, it's certainly within the extractive industries because of the impacts that they have had. They have a direct impact, but they have been working in this arena, looking at initiatives like no net loss, net positive impact, much longer, I think, than any other industry sector. But then when you, you see that they can drive a lot of the um, engagement with biodiversity along their supply chains, and I think it's where the supply chains, um, where the initiatives are happening, whether it's the Suppliers Partnership for the Environment or other supply chain initiatives, then you're seeing companies like the um, OEMs the, in the auto industry driving change out of their, out their supply chains. So I think both of those are going to be main leaders in helping biodiversity be integrated in maybe smaller, medium-sized enterprises that they haven't been before when we think about supply chains, but also maybe the extractive industries can help the other industries learn from their experiences over the last few decades as they've struggled to find great frameworks for the work that they need to do to um, mitigate their impact and show uplift for biodiversity. Okay, we just have um, a few more questions. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the question or the chat box. Uh, the next question is, we've actually seen an increase in interest in conservation programs from our employees, despite the limited access to our site. Do you see this as a trend or consequence of COVID? I guess who knows what a consequence of COVID is, but I think one of the things we can all agree is that and in you know the first year of COVID, nature was the only thing that was left open. Everything else was closed, whether it was retail, sports, entertainment, but nature continued and people found nature or refound nature depending. And I think if we can create ways for people to maintain that connection to nature, um, it will be it will benefit us all to allow employees to work outside, to be outside, to congregate outside, and to create nature-centric programs to allow them to do that. Um, should be something, should be a, a learning that we take out of the COVID crisis, and something that we don't forget is what nature gave us at the very beginning of this pandemic. Okay, and then I think this will be our last question, and it's kind of fun. Um, someone um, <laughs> says, uh, I live in California, I've never experienced cicadas. Can you please describe the experience and where you live? Is it very loud? <laughs> yes, it is very loud. So I'm right now on the eighth floor of a building, and I'm in a corner office, and I can see cicadas flying all around me right now. And if it was quiet, I could actually hear them um, with closed windows and an eighth floor. But at street level, they're incredibly loud and there are three different types of sounds, all of which sound almost extraterrestrial when you don't know what they are. And um, yes, it is, it's a fascinating, if you're into them, it's really interesting. If you don't like them, it is very, very freaky. So um, I encourage everybody to come here 17 years from now and experience one of the few urban nature phenomena that exist. Okay, great, and that concludes our Q&A. Okay, well, thank you so much, Monica. I appreciate those questions from everybody. Um, and thank you all for coming to this session. And remember to attend the WHC Species Project Awards um, soon after this session and also at 10.30 Eastern, we welcome today's keynote speaker, um, Dr. Scott Edwards for his talk, which is discovering teaching and cycling through the, through the diversity of birds. So I'll see you all then. Thank you very much.